Chapter 2 of Hosea from the Holy Bible with original notes by Thomas Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Israel is convicted of aggravated idolatry and base ingratitude, and threatened with heavy judgments, verses 1 to 13. God allures them with promises of reconciliation, and of many blessings to them and to others by their means, verses 14 to 23. Verse 1. Say ye unto your brethren, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruhamah. Verse 2. Plead with your mother. Plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight, and her adulteries from between her breasts. Verse 3. Lest I strip her naked, and set her as in the day that she was born, and make her as a wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. Verse 4. And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. Verse 5. For their mother hath played the harlot. She that convinced them hath done shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers, that gave me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. Verse 6. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns, and make a wall, that she shall not find her paths. Verse 7. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now. Verse 8. For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Verse 9. Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof, and my wine in the season thereof, and will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. Verse 10. And now I will discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver her out of mine hand. Verse 11. I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, and her sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. Verse 12. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she hath said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me, and I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. Verse 13. And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them, and she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers, and forgat me, saith the Lord. Verse 14, Therefore, behold, I will allure her, and bring her into the wilderness, and speak comfortably to her. Verse 15, And I will give her her vineyards from thence, and the valley of Achor for a door of hope, and she shall sing there, as in the days of her youth, and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Verse 16, And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shalt call me no more Bali. Verse 17, For I will take away the names of Balim out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. Verse 18, And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of the heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow and the sword, and the battle out of the earth, and will make them to lie down safely. Verse 19, And I will betroth thee unto me for ever, yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness, and in judgment, and in loving kindness, and in mercies. Verse 20, I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. Verse 21, And it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. Verse 22, and the earth shall hear the corn, and the wine, and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. Verse 23, And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy, and I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. Notes Verse 1 God had promised that, where it had been said to them, Ye are not my people, there it should be said, Ye are the children of the living God which has been explained of the calling of the Gentiles and the dispersed Israelites into the church, and the Jews are here exhorted to acknowledge them as brethren, and to call them Ami, or My people, and Ruhamah, or having obtained mercy. They were required to treat all as brethren and sisters who had obtained mercy and were become God's people, and to congratulate them on their admission to this happy estate. It may also intimate that when Israel should be cast off from being God's peculiar people, there would still be found a remnant to which his servants might thus address themselves at the time when the prophet wrote, and when the Jewish nation was rejected after the coming of Christ. 
Some expositors interpret this of the general restoration of the Jewish nation, but St. Paul evidently quotes the passage referred to as a prediction of the calling of the Gentiles. Verses 2 to 5. While the servants of God were directed to own as brethren the converted Gentiles and the restored of Israel, they were called on to plead in the name of God with their mother, or the church and nation of Israel. When the prophets protested against idolatry and the pious remnant separated from the idolaters, though their kings, princes and priests and the bulk of the nation were of that number, they then pleaded with their mother. When Christ and his apostles severely reproved the chief priests, scribes, Pharisees and the nation in general, and foretold their rejection and the calling of the Gentiles, they pleaded with their adulterous mother and took the Lord's part against her, and by encouraging penitent publicans, harlots, Samaritans and Gentiles, they said to their brethren, Ami, and to their sisters, Ruhama. It might be deemed undutiful for sons to plead against their mother, yet the honour of their God and Father on this occasion required it. She was therefore to be reminded that the Lord no longer considered her as his wife, or himself as her husband, and that he would proceed to execute judgment on her unless she repented and reformed. This was expressed by putting away her whoredoms out of her sight, and her adulteries from between her breasts, etc., and it implied a command to put away all the idols from the land and to avoid whatever might tempt them or others to that crime and to pull down, as it were, the idols that were set up in their hearts. If this were not done immediately, the Lord threatened that he would strip her naked, etc. That is, he would deprive the people of all their honourable distinctions and desirable advantages and reduce them to the most abject, contemptible and miserable condition similar to their bondage in Egypt in the infancy of the nation and would leave them as in a wilderness to perish with hunger and thirst. Nor would he show mercy to their children, for they were born of idolaters, brought up in idolatry, and even dedicated to idols, and therefore God regarded them as children of whoredoms. And indeed what else could have been expected of them when their mother had been so abandoned as to run into the most shameful practices? For the people in general ascribed their temporary plenty and prosperity to the bounty of their idols, and were emboldened to go on in the abominable worship of them, by abounding in everything which they could abuse to sensuality. Thus the heathens used to worship one imaginary deity as the giver of their corn, another as the giver of their wine, or of their fruit, etc., and in the festivals kept in honour of these idols they ran into the most shameful excesses. By lovers are meant, in the first place, the idols with which the Israelites committed spiritual fornication, Jeremiah 3 verse 1, and then the idolatrous nations whose alliance they courted, and in order to it practised their idolatries. Loath. There seems no sufficient evidence for interpreting this chapter exclusively of the ten tribes as many expositors do. Verses 6 and 7. The Lord did not intend to cast off all the seed of Israel, and therefore, speaking of the nation in general, he declared his purpose of keeping them from sinking into universal idolatry. Whilst the infatuated harlot was bent on following after her lovers, he was resolved to make a thorn hedge across her road, through which she could not pass without greatly tearing herself, nay, to build a wall which she could not get over to find her paths, so that, though she attempted to follow her lovers, she should not overtake them, etc. That is, the Lord would so punish his people by heavy judgments as to preserve them from total idolatry, so that, whilst numbers would perish, a remnant would be cured of that sin. When the ten tribes were carried into Assyria and the Jews to Babylon, Neither their idols nor their idolatrous allies could do them any good, and not being able to overtake them, or to find protection and deliverance from them, they would be convinced of their folly in forsaking the living God for dead idols, their first husband for these worthless lovers, and so coming to themselves they would be led to return home, to repent, to seek reconciliation and readmission to their former privileges. This seems immediately to predict the restoration of the Jews and many Israelites with them from the Babylonish captivity, when they were effectually cured of gross idolatry, but the future conversion of the nation may also be intended. Verses 8 and 9. The people did not understand, consider, or acknowledge that the Lord gave them all their temporal mercies, and this forgetfulness exposed them to be tempted to abuse them in sacrifices, oblations, or vestments, prepared for Baal and other idols. To convince them of this, the Lord intended to resume his grant. It had been but a loan to them, which he would recover by distraining upon them for it, seeing they had thus most evidently forfeited it. 
At the very season when she expects to receive the fruits of the earth, her enemies shall invade her and destroy them. Loth. Verses 10 to 13. God himself determined to cause all the nations whose idols Israel had worshipped to witness their wickedness and shame, nor should any deliver them from deserved punishment. The Israelites observed festivals in honor of their idols, yet they seem to have paid regard to some of those appointed in the law, and to have made them seasons of carnal mirth and sensual indulgence, and the Jews came from the worship of idols to celebrate them at the temple. Jeremiah 7 verses 9 and 10. But the Lord would turn their mirth into mourning, when, by his desolating judgments, he destroyed all their vines and fig trees, which they vainly supposed were given them by their idols, as a recompense for worshipping them. Thus he would visit on the nation the sins of all those days and years, during which they had worshipped Baalim, or idols, when they had resembled an adulteress that adorns herself with her most costly attire at the expense of her injured husband, that she may be the more agreeable to her vile paramours. For... They were entirely forgetful of the authority of God and their obligations to him. Jehu had destroyed Baal out of Israel, but the people had substituted other idols in his place, and so had filled up the measure of their father's crimes. It is probable that the idolaters adorned themselves with great care, as well as wore peculiar garments when worshipping their idols. 2 Kings 10 verse 22 by showing how harlots trim themselves to please others, he declareth that superstitious idolaters set a great part of their religion in decking themselves on their holy days. Verses 14 to 17. The preceding prophecies were fulfilled in the captivities of Israel and Judah, and perhaps in the present dispersion of the Jews. But when these judgments had prepared the way, the Lord intended to deal with them in a more gentle manner. He would allure or persuade them to return to him by invitations and hopes of reconciliation and felicity. He would thus draw them off from carnal pleasures and confidences and make all their former delusions to vanish so that they would see themselves in a barren wilderness and exposed to inevitable ruin unless the Lord helped them, as was the case with their fathers in the wilderness. And when they should thus be reduced to despair of help, he would speak comfortably to them and encourage them to trust in his mercy, grace and providence. Thus he would, from that destitute and forlorn condition, restore them to the possession of their former privileges, as if fruitful vineyards were suddenly given in a barren wilderness, and the valley of Achor, or Trouble, where Achan was stoned, in which Israel had fallen before his enemies, would be for a door of hope, preparing them for mercy by humbling them and leading them to renounce their idols and seek help from God alone. This valley was also one of the first acquisitions of Israel in Canaan, and an encouraging earnest of their possessing the whole. Thus being delivered from all their enemies and sorrows, they would sing praises with joyful hearts, as their fathers had done before, when they saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. From that time they would be more cordially attached to the Lord than ever, no longer calling him Bali, or my Lord and Master, alluding to the authority, rather than the affection of a husband, but Ishi, which is the language of cordial affection in a woman speaking to her husband. For the abuse of the word Balim in the worship of their idols should lead to a total disuse of it, so that it should no more be remembered or employed by them. This may primarily foretell their restoration from the Babylonish captivity, yet it may also be applied to the conversion of the Jews and Israelites to Christ in the apostolic days and to the future conversion of that nation. Perhaps the incarnation of Christ may be referred to in the name here mentioned, Ishi, my husband, or literally man. Isaiah 32, verses 1 and 2. Verses 18 to 20. When the people were weaned from idols and attached in love and faithfulness to the worship of the Lord, he would then not only renew his covenant with them, but he would make a covenant in their behalf with the beasts of the field, etc. That is, he would take care that no creature should do them any harm, and that all should concur in doing them good. Their land was occupied by the beasts of the field during the captivity when it had been desolated by war. But he would afterwards rid the country of these creatures and defend it from invaders and make it a quiet and secure habitation for them. Nay, he would betroth them to himself as their husband, their kind friend, protector, and companion, in the most solemn and public manner. He would engage the honour of his righteousness, wisdom, loving kindness, mercy, and truth for their security, employ these attributes for their good, and glorify himself in his dealings with them. He would communicate to them wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, 
he would enrich, ennoble, adorn and rejoice them with all the comforts and blessings of the marriage relation, and perform all his precious promises to them, and thus he would cause them to know him as their Lord and God. This can only be understood in its highest sense of the conversion of the Jews to Christ, and of the inestimable blessings and privileges of the spiritual Israel, of all true believers, to which they are admitted by faith in Christ and union with him, and a participation of his righteousness, unsearchable riches, and mediatorial blessings. No, etc. Thou shalt find that I am and will be a gracious Lord unto thee. Bishop Hall Verses 21-23 to 23. When this happy change should take place in Israel's condition, that had before been so desolate and perilous, all things in heaven and earth would contribute to their advantage. This is represented in very bold, figurative language. The heavens are introduced as beseeching the Lord to fill their clouds with water, to water the land, and he promises to hear them. The earth is represented as calling on the heavens to pour down rain, and they hear. The fruits of the ground call also on the earth to furnish them with supplies, and are heard, and these again regard the desires and wants of Jezreel, or that people who had been the seed of God yet by him scattered, but are now to be gathered to him. All nature seems here alive and active in helping the converted Jews, and the supply of their spiritual wants, in answer to the prayers of the people and ministers of Christ, and through the ordinances of his appointment may also be thus typified. The dispersion of the Jews would at length prove, like the scattering of seed upon the earth, in order to a large increase, for God would, through them, or by means of his believing people, who are dispersed as seed in the earth, have mercy on them who had not obtained mercy, and gather those among his people that had not before owned him as their God. This is applied by the apostles to the conversion both of Jews and Gentiles to Christ, and we may suppose that the latter part of the chapter refers to that restoration of Israel, which shall be as life from the dead to the nations of the earth. Practical Observations, verses 1 to 13. We should own and love all those as brethren whom the Lord appears to have put among his children, and encourage them with the consideration that they have obtained mercy and are become the people of God. But the ministers of Christ must not connive at the abuses or crimes of that religious community which claims the authority and stands in the relation to them of a mother. For the glory of God and the interests of his truth and righteousness should be far nearer to our hearts than the credit or favour of our fellow creatures, however related to us or advanced above us. And indeed every Christian ought, by his example, profession and conversation, to protest against the superstitions, errors or abuses of that church to which he belongs, or from which he hath been brought forth. For eminently pious persons are sometimes raised up within these corrupt churches, which God is about to give up to destruction, on purpose to bear testimony against them, and call men to repentance, that a remnant may be preserved or rescued from the contagion that hath infected the rest. If men would escape sin and condemnation, they must put all occasions of evil out of sight, repress the rising sinful inclinations of the heart, and shun whatever may be a temptation to them, or render them temptations to others. Impenitent sinners will soon be stripped of all their abused advantages and worldly prosperity, and exposed to the utmost shame, contempt, and misery, and they, who have trained up their children in impiety, iniquity, or false religion, cannot reasonably expect that God will confer spiritual blessings upon them. Such men often ascribe their temporal enjoyments to their sins or idols, and thus are emboldened to more iniquity, whereas the Lord giveth us all things richly to enjoy, and the devil tempts men to consume them upon their lusts. When we are infatuated by the violence of any headstrong passion or harassing temptation, and bent upon the gratification of our depraved inclinations, it is a special mercy to have our way hedged up with thorns, or closed by some insurmountable wall, that we may not be able to overtake our beloved idols and pleasures, and if pain, sickness, or calamity keep us from sin, we should be thankful for it. Every gracious soul will habitually prefer suffering to sin, and it is even a mercy to ungodly men to be kept by severe affliction from treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath. But if unsurmountable obstructions and inextricable difficulties not only disable them for a time from finding any pleasure in their sins or from committing them, but are the means at length of bringing them to themselves to perceive and lament their folly in departing from God and to return to Him humbly seeking forgiveness and salvation, the mercy is inestimably precious. 
when professors of the gospel depart from the ways of God and meet with no such thorn hedges and strong walls to impede their sinful course, and to bring them back ashamed and humbled, their case looks very dark. But if backsliders are by such discipline led to say, I will go and return to the Lord, that I may again have the comfort of communion with him and of my relation to him, for then it was far better with me than now, we should encourage and exhort them to decision in so doing. If men forget or consider not that their comforts come from God, and so they use them in a sinful manner, he will often in mercy take them away to bring the offenders to reflect on their folly and danger. When he turns unjust stewards out of their stewardship and calls them to give an account of it, none of their friends or idols can deliver them out of his hand, and all shall see and be constrained to confess that they deserve their ignominy and misery. In this our land of affluence and abundance, what numbers prepare their corn, wine, oil, gold, and silver for Baal, by their excess luxury and ostentation. And often the behaviour of those that are employed in gathering in the precious fruits of the earth seems to be an attempt to revive the bacchanalian riots of ancient idolaters. Men who live in allowed sin and then pretend to rejoice in God's ordinances or on religious festivals, as many ungodly persons do in their carnal way of celebrating Christmas, etc., are most awfully deceived. All such rejoicing is vain and tends to weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verses 14 to 23. When sinners seem ripe for vengeance, the Lord sometimes shows his sovereign grace in having mercy on them. To bring them to repentance, he both drives them from their sins by his terrors and judgments, and allures them by discoveries of his love and hopes of acceptance and happiness. He often deprives them of all hope and comfort in the world and from themselves, and when their humiliation, terrors, and sorrows tend to desperation, he speaks comfortably to their hearts. He brings them into a desolate wilderness where no joy can be found except from his mercy, and thence he gives them all the provisions of his grace and the comforts and privileges of his salvation. He makes the valley of deep dejection and extreme trouble to be a door of hope to them, and drives them to despair of earthly joy and help from themselves, that being shut out from every other door they may knock at mercy's gate until it be opened. Then their terrors and sorrows are terminated, he brings them out of the horrible pit and puts a new song into their mouths, and they sing, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, yet thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is become my salvation, I will trust and not be afraid. Though the Lord loses none of his authority by his condescending love to us, yet his awful majesty thus becomes the object of our confidence and delight, and believers are enabled to expect all that tenderness and kindness from their holy God, which a beloved wife can expect from the most affectionate husband, yea, far more. But he saves them from their idols, and sets them against their sins, and disposes them to walk before him in newness of life, as well as gives them the joy of his favour and salvation. If this new covenant be made with us, he will make all things to work together for our good, and every creature shall help us, for all things are ours, even death itself, and we may lie down with peace and security in his clay-cold bed, having committed our spirit into the Redeemer's hands. Happy then are they who are thus betrothed to the Lord in righteousness, judgment, loving-kindness, mercies, and faithfulness, though in themselves poor and polluted, weak and foolish, yet in him they have wisdom, strength, and righteousness, and they are enriched, ennobled, arrayed with garments of salvation, and made most blessed for evermore. Even the vilest of transgressors are now invited to seek, and encouraged to hope for, union with the Lord of life and glory in this honourable and endeared relation, nor can too much be expected from His grace who shed His precious blood for rebels and enemies. Let us then seek an interest in these blessings, compared with which all others are worthless. Let us remember that we are sown in the earth as seed, that in our several places we may conduce to the conversion of our fellow sinners, that they may seek and obtain mercy who had not obtained mercy, and that they may say to the Lord, Thou art my God, who have been strangers and enemies. Let us keep this object in view in all our actions and our whole conversation, and let us continually pour out our supplications for ourselves and all around us to God, who will give grace and glory and withhold no good thing from those that walk uprightly. End of chapter 2